Well, it's another early start here in France, and we're off to the Brocantes. The bells are ringing here again in France and we're on a, out on an early Sunday morning and we're in Bussy Le Long and we're just arriving at our first Brocon for this morning. So come on, let's see what treasures Caroline's going to discover this time. Well, so far, no big spend. Caroline's searching, but she's not finding what she's looking for. But of course, so much of the fun is in the hunt, as always. So let's keep looking. If you want two coins or five. Okay. Well, the sun is coming up over the buildings now. It's starting to get a bit brighter. That's one thing. When you get an early start, you get to see the sunrise, which is another bonus on top of all the other pleasures of wandering around in a village, looking at all the bargains. But we're just about done here, and it looks like I'm the only one to make a purchase. Well, it was a joint purchase, because it's a little gift for one of our children from Caroline and myself, because they've started coin collecting. So we've got them a nice French coin that's well over 100 years old. So that seemed like a nice idea. A bit of personal shop in there that isn't going into Caroline's craft. <laughs> well, we have made a purchase. Purchase just for less. <laughs> yes, our breakfast. Panorazan for me and pan au chocolat for Caroline. So we're going to enjoy those 
and hopefully you're going to enjoy the view as I take you to a place that is historic, yes, but it is fantastic. It is fantasy. It is a chateau castle like you've never seen before. Come on, let's pop over to Pierfond for a look round. park and apparently there's a castle around here somewhere but where oh there it is here we are at Pierfond Chateau and boy is it noisy and what a lot of scaffolding it seems everywhere we go in France to see something beautiful they're working on keeping it beautiful look at that fancy working up there. Imagine dropping something and having to run all the way back down to the bottom to pick it up. Monkey's happy because in the ground here at Pierfont there are chestnut trees so he's got Chateau Conquers. Chateau Conquers is that a phrase? It's French. For what? <laughs> it's, it's French for Conquers from the Chateau. <laughs> I can see a little gate. I know it's locked but whenever I see a little gate or a little door I just have to go have a look. So I thought you'd like to come with me. Let's have a look. Oh, it's about five foot high, so it's not extremely high. And there are some steps and also some sort of drainage pipe. Hmm. I wonder if maybe that was just for all the nasty bits of water and liquids of dubious means to come out into the moat or something like that. It doesn't seem to be a major doorway, does it? And then, of course, up above, you've got that. <laughs> oh, I could be quite happy living in one of those towers. I don't even need the one tower, they're so big. Saying that, Phil would need the other two to keep all the things from his shed. Now today, what we see here is in part an illusion because there is nothing left of the original fortress. There was an immense fortress here. It was so domineering here on this hilltop. It was a real place of power and strength. It was built in the 14th century, but then in the 17th century, Louis XIII had it demolished. And all that remained was a pile of rubble. For 200 years, the rubble just lay here and attended, forgotten. Pierfont was no longer on anyone's map. Then, the end of the 18th, beginning of the 19th century, Romanticism took hold. And a variety of artists, engravers, painters, draftsmen, all come rushing here because they were inspired by the romantic notion of what once stood here and the beauty of the ruins that they could move amongst. In 1832, a gentleman by the name of Louis Philippe was so impressed by the ruins that stood here, he held a banquet in the middle of the ruins to celebrate his daughter's wedding. But the fortunes of this place really transformed with the visit of Louis Napoleon in 1850. He totally fell in love with the place and when he took power as Napoleon III, 
he made the decree that he wanted the chateau rebuilt as a majestic residence for himself. That decision is why we have this building here today. But originally it wasn't planned to look as it does because the thought was let's rebuild what was there in the 14th century. But the choice of architect changed everything. In 1858, Napoleon III appointed Viollet le Duc as his architect. Now, for the first couple of years, till 1861, everything was going well. He presented plans to restore what was here. Then everything changed because he decided that he was going to create something that was out of his imagination based on the concept of medieval architecture but also using all of the benefits of the Industrial Revolution. He took fantasy and industrial development science, brought it all together and created this amazing building. Originally, they were going to pay homage to this romantic love of ruins and just restore part of the building. But then it was going to be a majestic residence. And he really did create something that was not in the wildest dreams what was once here, but in his wildest dreams was what should have been here. The imagery here is created out of fantasy as well as history. And the two combined came up with something phenomenal. Originally, a restoration plan, then a reconstruction. But eventually, they came up with a recreation that was born out of the mind of Le Duc. Le Duc made no apology for the way in which he took on this recreation. Throughout the chateau, he used emblems of empire. The eagle is prolifically used right the way throughout the hallways. He came up with all sorts of fantastical animals and alongside those, domestic cats. There are stone carvings of cats, throughout the building and it is said no two of them are identical. He just allowed his imagination to run wild. But this wasn't just some frivolous fantasy. This was something that Le Duc believed in as a principle of restorative architecture. Because he actually wrote down his feelings about how this should be done. He actually wrote, to restore a building is to recreate it in a complete form. Indeed, a form which may have never existed. And in 1866, he actually wrote concerning his creation here at Pierfonts. Pierfonts is not fantastical pastiche, but rather a free interpretation of a building of the medieval period. Thanks to Napoleon III's inspired choice of architect, we now have this amazing building with its sheer walls and towers that just seem to go up to the sky, creating for us the image that we all hold of that Arthurian legend type castle. But of course, Napoleon III never got to live at his chateau because his reign was over by 1870. Neither did the architect himself see the completed work as he died in 1879. But his son-in-law decided in tribute to the great man, that is the architect himself, that he would take a statue of a pilgrim, which is 
at the centre of the entrance to the chapel here. And it is done in the form of the Duke himself. There's no denying that the Duke really split opinion. For some, this was more folly than a fortress. It wasn't real because he had used steel reinforcement in order to create the archways. Everyone had their point of view. But ultimately, perhaps the greatest validation of the dream that he held is the number of movies that have come here and used this as it's set in. And for me, the BBC's filming of Merlin here on location is probably the pinnacle of saying Le Duc got it right with his fantasy image of a medieval castle as we all imagine it should have been. What do you think? As we head back over now to find more bargains in the Brocant, we leave you with a view of this phenomenal place. And don't forget, it wasn't just a leader of France in Napoleon III that fell in love with this place, because it is said that there was a visit here by Michael Jackson in 1996, and he really liked it. So much so, he had a stone model of it made to put in his home back in the United States. Are you in agreement with me, Michael Jackson, and Napoleon III? Or is it a bit too much for you? Have a look. Hope you enjoyed that trip round Pierfont half as much as we did. Monkey certainly had a wonderful time. And now it's time to have a look round the Brocont here at another village. What's it called again? Ombleny. Ombleny. I keep calling it Ambleny, but it's Ombleny. And from what we see, it's looking beautiful because we're parked just opposite a gorgeous big church building, which looks absolutely stunning. But now we're going to take a walk into town as soon as I finish this and then we'll show you what other bargains we find today. Hmm. Yes, that's one of the beauties of being out and about at the Brocants. It's not just the bargains and the things that we find, but it's the places we see. It gives you an excuse to go to a village that is two kilometres off the main road and somewhere you may never have gone to if it wasn't that they were old in a brocant. And then you get to see the beautiful architecture, the lovely houses, and just get the sense of France. Because as we go down here, we've got the mairie, with the flags flying. So it's just round the corner and we'll be at the brocant. So let's make a move and see what we can find. <laughs> Mm. 
sais pas si vous êtes un peu vous êtes là. Elle parle pas beaucoup, vous voyez. Celui qui a l'huile magou, c'est ma gueule. Mais oui, mais bon. Les boules de Noël, 1 euro le sachet. Le sachet. Quand je vous ai dit que c'était des tout petits prix, c'est des tout petits prix. Nous, c'est pour éviter de jeter. Alors, euh, hop, nous on a les attachés, on en a fait des suspensions comme ça, mais vous pouvez les dissocier, les remettre dans votre sapin. Vous voyez, il y en a un peu partout, là on les a classés par couleur. 1 euro le sachet. C'est quand même pas une belle affaire ça. Là c'est tout des verts. Là il y a des blancs, des verts, et vous, alors après vous avez tout des guirlandes. 1 euro, 1 euro. 1 euro, 1 euro. Si vous prenez le tout, ça fait 2 euros. Et mais là, si vous prenez, ça fait 3 euros. <rire> Well, Caroline's been buying, I'm carrying, and she's bought a fair bit. But it looks like Caroline's theme for today is three months in advance. Because whereas it's September the 25th, actually everything she's bought is for December the 25th. It's very much a Christmas themed brocante for Caroline so far today. Well, let's see what else she comes up with as we just finish off the last few stalls. Well, that's Caroline's Christmas shopping done for one brocante. Now we're going to go on and try and find another. But while we do that, why not nip over to the shed with me now and see what's going on down there. Hi, it's great to be back with you in the shed again this week. And thank you everyone for all of the lovely comments you've made about some of the craft that I've done and just being here in the shed surrounded by all these incredible finds that we've picked up on our adventures together. Today, I'm going to use a find from the Brocante. And here it is. Now, Caroline said, ah, oh, it hasn't got a lid. <laughs> well, you all know me far too well to think that not having a lid is gonna let me leave something behind, especially when we were busily trying to make up lots of three. Because the guy says, any three things for a euro. Well, there's a challenge. And I decided to help Caroline by adding my little teapot to her collection of pieces. Now, I think she spent about three euros. So there's quite a few bits and pieces that have been picked up. But this is mine. And today I want to do something with it. Uh, I've been down here at the shed having a rummage around trying to decide what to use. And I was looking to see what other bits of brass I had. Stuff that we've picked up from the dump. Stuff that we've collected from the bottoms of old auction boxes during our trading days on eBay. Anything that I had lying around in a drawer somewhere in a box that would go with this. And I found a few little pieces because I've come up with this, which I think will go very nice with it. So there we go, I've got that. I've also got this rather hefty ring as well. And then I came across this little character who we picked up on one of our visits, I believe, to Yorkshire. I believe we were with our friend Tom Burley when we collected this little chap. So I thought, right, he looks good. And here's something that definitely came from that part of the world, and that's my plinth. Yet another plinth. So what is it we're going to do? Well, I'd like to create something that gives a sense of what is at the heart of everything that I do on the channel, and that's history. I heard somebody say this week, I believe it was Les Brown listening to one of his talks on YouTube, and he said... History can be read, but history is also being written. 
It's all about the passage of time and what we are doing today could be the history that's being read tomorrow. And I love that concept. So with this little character and with the bits and pieces I've got and this gorgeous numbering off the front of a clock and to finish it off a little teapot lid or mustard pot lid I'm going to put together a little piece that represents the passing of time history past present and future the history that we read the history that we are writing for others to read as time goes by. So let's get on with it and see what you think as I put it together. pleased with the way this has turned out. This little character here popping his head up through the lid of this beautiful timeless teapot. Is he from the past? Look into the future. Is he from the future? Look into the past. That sense of time passing with the circle of numbers, the numerals off the clock. Of course, this would be very lightweight if it wasn't for that lovely plinth that's going to give it stability. So it certainly reflects the concept of history and my understanding of it. But now I want to personalize it. I want this to represent in part something that is my story, something which is part of my past, which now I refer to in anecdotes and not only tell others about, but learn from the experiences I knew there myself. So I'm going to add just a couple of little pieces and I'll just show them to you now because we had an item a little while ago that was in a box of bits and it was very broken. It was meant to be a piece of memorabilia from a particular colliery and these little items were on it. It was, it was a little dram on a plinth as you can see here. The name of the colliery is there and these pieces were arranged on here and this little dram of coal which I assume came from the colliery was also on the plinth. So it was all nicely arranged but it had been smashed and broken. Now I intend to use all these bits at various times in craft but for today I'm going to see if I can apply these in a way that will add personal dimension to my piece of art. So let's have a go. pleased with that I started off with the idea of trying to convey the concept of history time passing history that's to be read and history that we are to write and I got the sense this worked but then I came to realize that with the memories that I have of finding this and this up in Yorkshire with Tom and finding the bits in boxes when we were 
on our journey through our eBay time and as the Celtic traders reselling. And then, of course, this pot that is part of our French experience, which Caroline and I have shared for many years and thoroughly enjoyed. Then bringing in the little elements from one of those auction boxes that speak of my days in the mines, then this is truly a statement piece, I think. So I'm just going to pop it on the shelf now, up in the studio, ready for the live show tomorrow. And I'll show it to you there on the shelf. And then we'll head back because there's more bargains to be bought. Wonderful things to be seen over there in France. Well, here we are at our third Brocant for today, and it's so close to home. Not as in Wales, but we're just half a mile from where we're staying, just along the river. Absolutely brilliant. Walking distance. What more could you want other than a bargain? So let's get in here and see some familiar places for those who've viewed our previous trips to France. But this time, instead of filming the history and dodging the traffic, we're going to be walking on the roads and picking up bargains. Okay, let's get on our way. Well, it's certainly busier today. There are crowds of people. You can see why the villagers look forward to these events. Last night here at Vixeren, they had the fireworks and celebrations, and today we've got the Brook Hunt. Officially, we're at the far end of the Brocant. As you can see, I'm walking out through the root buddy where it's all blocked off. But of course, just because you're not within the confines of the closed roads, doesn't mean that you can't set up outside your own home, which is exactly what someone has done right here. As you can see, Caroline's down there amongst the crowds, having a little look what this gentleman has brought out from his house. Makes you wonder where he fitted it all. Of course, 
what actually happens is a lot of these folks they collect stuff all year ready for today so let's go have a look and see what he's got seems quite strange today to be walking on the road in Vixeren when we recorded here previously doing the history of the donjon that's up behind me we were having to stop and cut and avoid the traffic and all sorts today we're just walking through crowds of people we're passing the town hall and all of the grand buildings and right outside everywhere houses gates drives the less it's all stalls all selling something Well, that was fantastic fun. We've had a great morning and the sun is still shining gloriously now that we've got back. Hope you've enjoyed the brocante with us as much as we've enjoyed searching amongst the treasures. Don't forget, if you want to see other adventures that we've taken, then check out the link up here. But until the next time, have fun. Bye.